you for having me. To start off with, let's give, give you a broad, broad overview of mass incarceration. So at the end of 2014, there were 1.5 million people in federal and state prisons. There was another 745,000 people in local jails. So that's a total of about 2,274,600 people behind bars. This is not counting people in immigrant detention. This is not counting children in juvenile detention. This is only adults in federal and state prisons and local jails. For women, the rate of imprisonment has increased between 2013 and 2014. In 2013, there were 104,300 women in federal and state prisons and local jails. At the end of 2014, that number had increased to 106,200. So you can see that even though um, we're talking about alternatives to incarceration, criminal justice reform, this has not done a lot for women going to prison. So what do you think of when you think of women in prison? What comes to mind? How are their issues different from those of men in prison? And who do you think goes to prison and why? Just raise your hand and call something out. Children who are left behind. The majority of people in prisons are parents, so I don't want to say that men who go to prison are not fathers, um, but for women, more than 80% of women in prison are mothers to children under the age of 18. And when you think about how we gender parenting, Oftentimes, when a father goes to prison, and I'm not saying that fathers don't miss their children and don't want to be with their children, but when they go to prison, oftentimes there is somebody, usually a female family member, who will take care of their children while they are behind bars. For mothers, their children are five times more likely to end up in the foster care system because either they are already a single head of household or they are arrested alongside their co-parent or there is no one in the family that is either able to take care of the children, willing to take care of the children, or that they feel is safe for their children to be around 24 7. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Adoption and Safe Families Act? Hillary Clinton mentioned this, yes, in um, the last debate, if you happen to watch that. Um, in 1997, Congress passed and pre President Bill Clinton signed into law the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act, which states that if a child has been in foster care for 15 of the past 22 months, the state is supposed to start proceedings to terminate parental rights. At the time, the average sentence for a woman in New York State prison was 36 months. So that meant for the women who didn't have family to take care of their children, they were in a lot of danger of permanently losing their parental rights. And here in New York State, after years and years and years of organizing by advocates, including formerly incarcerated mothers, some of whom had lost their children under the Adoption and Safe Families Act, they managed to pass what they call the ASFA, Adoption and Safe Families Act, Expanded Discretion Act, which allows family court judges and social workers to slow down that timeline if the reason the child is in foster care is because of parental incarceration. But again, this took years and years of organizing and advocacy. This wasn't some light bulb moment for a lawmaker. Other things that come to mind when you think of women in prison. Rape, yes, sexual assault is a very big danger in women's jails and prisons. And again, this is not to say that men in prison don't also face sexual abuse and assault. So there, it ranges from, in women's prisons, it ranges from all out sexual assault, you know, it, for whatever you can imagine, to things like being on the toilet or on the shower and having male guards watch you because that's part of their job. They can walk into their, your housing unit at any given time because that's part of their job. Um, being strip searched. Um, by, you know, before and after a visit or any time you leave to go, to, say, to the hospital or to court, or um, being pat searched, which is when you are searched, but you're, your clothes aren't taken off, but it's basically like being frisked really aggressively. Um, and in a lot of states, male guards are allowed to pat search women, which of course is really traumatic, even when you're having another woman pat search you to have somebody grope you. So to have a woman, uh, a man be able to do this as part of his job is also horrifying. So there's a whole gamut of sexual abuse that happens 
in women's prisons. And some of this is the day-to-day -day running of the prisons, not even a malicious intent by somebody else. Other things that come to mind when you think of women in prison. I mean, one of the things about sticking a huge number of people in a really small space and then locking them in there for extended periods of time is that tempers flare, people who don't have great conflict resolution skills, de-escalation skills, you know, get upset at each other and angry at each other. And then if you think about the fact that in jails and prisons, you often don't get enough. You know, so you don't get enough food, you don't get enough, you certainly don't get enough nutritious food, you don't get enough toilet paper, you don't get enough time to, you know, speak to your children on the phone, you don't get enough, um, if in a women's jail or prison, you often don't get enough sanitary napkins or tampons, you know, like, so all these, like, little things that you don't get enough of means that your tempers are really hot and they, they flare up. And then we are also, as a society, not really conditioned to, like, de-escalate conflict and, you know, work through things together. So yes, there's always the potential, and people have complained in both men's and women's prisons of like the constant anxiety of being stuck in this room or in this like giant prison with all these people whose tempers are flaring and everything else. Being disenfranchised in many states, um, there are only two states that allow you to vote while you are in prison. That's Vermont and Maine. Um, in many states, you can vote while you're in jail, but there's being able to vote, and then there's actually being able to vote, um, like getting your registration, getting your absentee ballot, having your absentee ballot go to the proper place, you know, like you put it in the box versus in the envelope, you know, so it goes to the Board of Elections. So here in New York State, if you are in jail, you can vote. Um, if you are out of prison and off parole, you can vote, but nobody tells you this, you know, or very few people tell you this. If you have a great case manager or parole officer, maybe they'll tell you that you have your right to vote is reinstated, but if you are <laughs> off parole and your parole officer is like, bye, you know, you don't, unless you find out some other way, you don't know that your right has been restored to be able to vote. So yes, so this is, and that's New York State. Every state is different, and sometimes it is really hard to figure out whether or not you can get back your right. Rehabilitative programs. So it varies from state to state, prison to prison, jail to jail. It's kind of like if you think of every jail or prison as its own little fiefdom, you know, like if a superintendent or a warden of a prison really believes in rehabilitation, they'll try to make the efforts to bring in volunteers and to bring in, you know, programming. If, but then if that warden leaves, the next warden might say, I don't see why you need to have a domestic violence program class. I don't see why you need a trauma class. I don't see why you need this support group you know, for mothers who've lost their children. This is a lot of work to have, and remember, unlike in Orange is the New Black, you don't get to just wander around prison by yourself. You don't get to be like, I'm gonna leave my housing unit and go to that housing unit and then go out to the yard. Like there's always officers escorting you. So they might, so a warden might say, I don't see why I need to devote the staff power to be able to bring 20 women from 20 different areas to this one area during this time, meh, leave them in their housing units. So it all depends on prison to prison and jail to jail. A misuse of solitary confinement um, in New York State. Um, in New York State, there was a Shoe Exclusion Act passed which stated that if you were seriously mentally ill, as opposed to like say partially mentally ill or you know not quite diagnosed mentally ill, um, pregnant, or a juvenile, you could not be placed in um, the shoe, which is a form of solitary confinement in which you're locked into your cell 23 and a half to 24 hours a day. So for those of you who live in tiny little shoebox apartments, imagine being locked in your bathroom for 23 to 24 hours a day for days on end. This does not um, prevent other people from being placed in solitary confinement. And across the nation, um, there are varying lack of limitations on who can be placed in solitary confinement and sometimes this can be something like you talked back to a guard or you refused to stand up for count or you were late for work so there's a whole range of things that can place you in solitary confinement it's not just that you stabbed somebody or slashed somebody or were quote unquote the worst of the worst which is what a lot of prisons would have you believe in most states and most prisons when a woman enters jail or prison pregnant, hopefully she gets sent to the hospital to give birth, although this is not always the case. There have been some horrifying 
stories of women who have, were ignored when they were in labor and were forced to give birth in their cells. But when a woman is taken to the hospital, which we hope happens most of the time, um, she is allowed between 24 to 48 hours in the hospital with her child. In New York State, and I believe six or seven other states, there are prison nursery programs in which a pregnant woman can apply to be in the nursery program with her newborn. Now, she has to like go through a whole gamut of things. Like in some states, like in New York State, you can't be, have been convicted of a crime involving violence. So then that means that if you are convicted of, say, burglary or assault, you're out, or a gun charge. You know, you can't be placed in the nursery program. Um, so if you are placed in the nursery program, you can take your baby home with you, or not, not home, to the nursery program with you. Um, if you are not, which is the majority of women who give birth um, behind bars, then you have 24 to 48 hours with your baby in the hospital. Sometimes the baby gets to stay in the room with you. Sometimes the baby goes to the hospital nursery and women are restrained. So if you don't know what that means, it means that you are handcuffed, and there's a chain that leads from your handcuffs to your waist. So imagine a waist chain like this. For those of you who ride bicycles, that's about as heavy as that chain gets, you know? Um, and then, so imagine being pregnant and or just having given birth and having this chain around you, and another chain that goes to your ankles, and your ankles get cuffed together. And in many hospitals, if you have to go to, say, the, the hospital nursery to go visit your baby, you're shackled in some form of this. So maybe the guard won't put on the waist chain, but they'll put on the handcuffs and the leg cuffs. And you go down the hallway in the hospital to go see your baby in this manner. Um, and sometimes they don't take all the restraints off. One woman reported that she had to go to the nursery and they didn't take the leg cuffs off the whole time. So she's holding her infant and she's never had an infant before. This is her first child. She's never had a baby in her life or baby in her life that she's held, and she's terrified that she's going to drop her baby because she's got her legs chained together. So, you know, imagine having to do that and knowing that you only have 24 to 48 hours with this baby as well. The issue of mothers not being able to keep their babies, and then there's also like the fact that they have their babies for such a short period of time. And either they make arrangements with family members to take their babies or their babies end up in foster care. In state prisons across the country, so this is not counting federal prisons, there's about 34,000 women incarcerated for what we would call violent crimes. So murder, manslaughter, assault, um, theft, something with a gun. Um, of those, 10,000 were sentenced to prison for murder, you know, in which somebody died. Um, so, and this is actually, I think, a larger population than people think of. Um, so, and then there's also things like drug crimes, you know, that a huge number of people, men, women, trans and gender binary, non-binary people go to prison for as well. When we talk about prisons, when we talk about prisons at, or incarceration at all, we need to be thinking about race. So, it's not that everybody gets treated equally by this system, which Hopefully everybody knows. When we talk about women in prison, we need to also be thinking about race. The latest statistics show that of every 100,000 black women in the United States, 109 of them are in prison. That's a lot of people, if you think about that. That's like, you know. Um, and you compare that to similar statistics for, or statistics for white women in which 53 of every 100,000 white women are in prison, and 64 of every 100,000 Latina women. And there aren't really nationwide statistics for any other ethnicity because apparently they don't exist. And this is not because black women necessarily commit more crimes or more dangerous or you know any of these other things politicians would have you believe, but it's because of racism and racial profiling. We live in New York City. If people have not firsthand experienced Policing and stop and frisk, we have read about it over and over and over again. Um, and as we know from stop and frisk here in New York City and then from other places and from police violence around the country, black people are more likely to be stopped and searched and often brutalized by the police than white people. And then when we get to the courtroom stage, black people are less likely to be offered an alternative to incarceration than their white counterparts. There was a California study that showed that two-thirds of drug treatment slots, so drug treatment instead of prison, went to white people. 
despite the fact that 70% of people with drug sentences were African American. There's the policing stage, there's the courtroom stage, you know, who gets given a, maybe you can get out of jail. Maybe not free, but maybe you don't have the prison sentence, and who doesn't? When we talk about prisons, we also need to be thinking about poverty. For women in prison, this is huge. One study found that only 40% of women in prison had been employed full-time before going to prison. So think about that, 40%. Um, and of those women who had been employed full-time, most had been working in low-paying jobs. So these were not jobs that were, you know, like $100,000 a year jobs. A lot of these jobs were minimum wage or up barely above minimum wage jobs. Another study found that um, two-thirds of women under supervision had never held a job that paid more than $6.50 per hour. Think about $6.50 per hour. I mean, we don't supposedly make that in New York State anymore um, with minimum wage. And this is further, you know, um, women get driven further down the hole because in 1996, then President Clinton passed what he called Welfare Reform, or the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act which drastically cut welfare. So there was a five-year lifetime limit on welfare, so you couldn't apply, you know, um, extend your ability to survive on welfare. It excluded support for children who were born to mothers already on welfare. It required recipients to work after two years, no matter what your childcare or other situations were. And there was a lifetime ban on welfare benefits for people with drug felonies and those who had violated probation or parole, which excluded over 100,000 women from welfare programs. So by the end of the 1990s, the number of people receiving welfare had fallen 53%, or 6.5 million people. For women, think about this, in 1996, the number of women in prison rose by 9.1%. So that year, they were nearly double the number of men sentenced to prison. And by the end of 2000, 91,612 women were incarcerated in prison. So about a 20,000 woman increase from 1996. So you can do the correlations of if you don't have the safety net. And welfare didn't provide this like robust, booming support that you could like live really well on, but it provided something, you know, for you perhaps to not starve or be able to keep your housing. Um, and if you take that little bit away, people then are forced to either starve or do something else to be able to survive. One other thing that affects women in prison more than men in prison is domestic violence. And you asked about crimes. We don't know how many women are in prison for defending themselves against domestic violence. So of those 34,000 women in prison for violent crimes, there is no data collected on whether or not they did so in self-defense, you know, um, in coercion from an abusive partner. There's just no, nobody collects this data. There are a couple of things we do know. One is old. In 1999, the Department of Justice found that half of women in adult state prisons and jails reported having experienced physical and or sexual abuse before their arrest. So if you think about the ways in which people report abuse, um, and if you know anybody who's experienced abuse, it's really hard to come forward with these stories. You know, you don't just open up to everybody on the street, random strangers, and you definitely, in a place like jail or prison, where everybody knows your business and it's not that safe to disclose, disclose abuse to some stranger that you've never seen before in your life holding a clipboard asking you you know, if you've ever experienced violence. What we also know in a report that came out last year is that in the juvenile justice system, 84% of girls experience violence in their home. 84% of the young girls that we lock up, you know, for things like running away, for fighting back, you know, for, you know, all sorts of like things that perhaps they wouldn't be locked up as, a, as adults, if they were adults. Um, experienced in-home violence. What we also know, or what we should know, is that it's extremely difficult and dangerous for women to leave abusive situations. It takes most people who are in abusive relationships seven to 10 times before they can actually successfully leave their abuser. You know, parts of this are emotional, parts of this are you love the person that is causing you harm, and parts of this are economic and practical. Where do you go if you don't have affordable housing and a safe place to live? We live in New York City. It is extremely expensive to get a tiny little shoebox 
Where do you go if you don't have those resources? And cutting away the social safety net has made escape even more difficult and sometimes impossible. Now that I've thrown all of these things at you, let me talk a little bit about some of the ways in which women in prison and women who have been in prison have been organizing. And because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I wanted to concentrate on what abuse survivors behind bars have been doing. I'm gonna jump back to the 19, late 1980s and go to Marysville, Ohio, which is where the women's maximum security prison is. And in the late 1980s, a group of women who were serving long sentences or life sentences start, decided to start a support group for themselves. So somebody asked about like rehabilitative programs and stuff like that. So they said, we are all doing these long sentences. We want to support each other through them. So they formed a group called Life, Looking Inward for Excellence Group. Um, and originally, they didn't have any other intention than supporting each other. And as they were talking over the weeks, they realized that many of them had been sentenced to life in prison for killing their abusive partners. Now, this was the late 1980s, in which people were not talking about domestic violence very much. You know, if you got hit or beaten by your partner, you know, it obviously was your fault and you kept it to yourself. They started realizing this, and they, started, they decided that they were going to start organizing around domestic violence, and they invited the governor of Ohio to come to one of their meetings and they asked him if he would consider clemency or a commutation of their sentences, meaning you would lessen their sentence so that they would eventually be able to get out for women in prison for defending themselves against domestic violence. The governor sent his aide and his wife to one of their meetings. They listened to their stories and they encouraged them to apply for clemency. Instead of saying, okay, the people in this life group are going to be the ones that apply for clemency, the women said, okay, we know that we're in here for defending ourselves, who else? might be able to apply for clemency. And again, keep in mind that you don't get to wander all over prison without an escort. You don't get to like, you know, go from your housing unit to somebody else's, you know, housing unit or wander around freely. But they did what they could with the fact that they were constrained in their movement and they reached out to other women. They went to the cafeteria, the, you know, the library, the yard. You know, they asked women in other housing units to spread the word and they spoke with other women in the prison and encouraged women who were domestic violence survivors to apply for clemency. And in some cases, this meant helping a woman overcome denial, making sure that she understood that whatever violence happened to her at the hands of her partner was not her fault, you know, that she didn't deserve it, understand that they had been abused, remember specific incidents of battering, and where they might find corroborating documentation, whether it's a hospital record, a police report, a neighbor's complaint, something that would bolster their clemency claim, um, applications. And in the end, this led to 18 more women applying for clemency. So that's 18 women that might have just sat in their cells and thought that they were a really, really awful person for killing their loved one. And in the end, the governor granted clemency to 25 women. So that's 25 women who were eventually able to leave prison, who had been sentenced to life in prison. And this made news all over. It was the first successful mass clemency for domestic violence survivors who were incarcerated for defending themselves. And so newspapers all across the country had headlines like, you know, the governor commutes, you know, these women's sentences. Some of them were like, you know, men watch out. Your wife can now kill you and walk out of prison, but it made headlines all over. It influenced a group in California to do their own clemency campaign. So in California, there was a support group called Convicted Women Against Abuse. It was a support group specifically for women who were domestic violence survivors. And when they read about this campaign, they said, let's do this on, in our prison. So they wrote a letter to then Governor Pete Wilson and asked him to consider commuting their sentences and like the women in Ohio said, why don't you come to one of our weekly meetings so you can understand what abuse is and how we ended up here. Now, California elects these law and order governors, so the governor didn't really care. And so he declined. He was not going to meet with them, said that he was not going to consider clemency for every single woman incarcerated in the state of California for defending herself. But he said he would consider their, in, their letter as a request for clemency from the women who signed it. And in the end, he granted clemency to only three women he denied it to seven, and he made no effort whatsoever on 24 of those women. But the other result of their clemency campaign is that their letter and their efforts drew the attention of outside advocates, including people who are working around domestic violence and people who are working around prisoner rights issues, to help support these women in first drafting their 
actual petitions, helping them to gather evidence. And then when the governor made his decision, or lack of decision, continued organizing and advocating for the release of women who were imprisoned for self-defense. And this is, has resulted in the release of 38 other abuse survivors who had been sentenced to either long sentences or life sentences since 2000. And as a result of these continued efforts, they got lawmakers to pass two bills, which allow abuse survivors who were sentenced before people knew about domestic violence and were including it in trials, to be able to um, apply for resentencing and um, for resentencing, so that that way judges could hear what the effects of abuse were in their actions. So it wasn't just this, you know, moment in time in which something violent and bad and harmful happened, but looking at what happened leading up to that. And it also, for women who were in prison, provided them a chance to present evidence of their abuse to the parole board if they were sentenced to a finite term in prison. So in the past, they would go before the parole board and then say, but I killed my husband because I endured X number of years or decades of abuse. And oftentimes, a parole board would say, you're not taking responsibility for your actions. So you're using the abuse excuse. We don't buy it. You're obviously not remorseful, parole denied. And that took away the ability of the parole board to do this. So this, was, this all came out of the fact that women in California said, you know, let's try to do our own clemency campaign. So coming back to New York State, since this is where we are, in New York State, clemency is not such a um, widespread thing under Governor this Governor Cuomo, there's not been very many clemencies at all. And in the history of New York State, the recent history of New York State from the 1980s on, only two domestic violence survivors have ever been granted clemency. So th there's not like a high batting rate or whatever you call it, you know, for women who are incarcerated for defending themselves against abuse. Um, so organizers, including formerly incarcerated abuse survivors, have been taking on another tactic and they are trying to get past the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. So it is a bill that is currently making its way through the state legislature. So for those of you who are registered to vote, you know, and or, you know, have a phone and can call your legislator, even if you don't like your legislator and aren't gonna vote for your legislator, um, keep this in mind. You know, this is making its way through the legislature right now. And what this act would do is that it would allow judges to take abuse into consideration when sentencing survivors who are convicted of charges related to their abuse. So this means if you defended yourself against an abusive spouse, you'd be able to bring that abuse into the courtroom. And even if you were convicted by a jury, the judge can say, you know, Ms. Jones, you probably wouldn't have done this had you not been in this abusive situation. I'm taking that into consideration and not sentencing you to the maximum amount that I would otherwise for this charge. This also um, affects abuse survivors who are arrested for crimes related to abuse. So for those of you who know how abuse works, when you are in an abusive relationship and your abusive partner says, we're gonna go rob that bodega, you don't get to say, honey, I don't wanna do that. Can we just stay home and watch TV instead? So, you know, so if you think about that, then that could affect another number of people um, who are currently facing charges, um, some of which are violent charges. And currently in New York State, keep this in mind, only people who are charged with a nonviolent crime are permitted to be sentenced to probation as an alternative to incarceration, which means that if you are convicted of, say, burglary or robbery or, you know, some, uh, or, assault or murder, you're not eligible for an alternative to incarceration, no matter what the circumstances. And this means that judges can't consider this for survivors who are convicted of self-defense or other actions. So the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act takes, allows judges to actually consider this, and it also allows survivors who are currently in prison to apply to courts for resentencing. So for women who've been in prison since the 1980s or early 1990s, this gives them a shot at being able to get a shorter sentence because they were simply because they were sentenced at a time when nobody was thinking about domestic violence and abuse and definitely weren't thinking about it in the ways that we are today. And in New York State, this would mean that at least 360 people, so approximately 185 women and 175 men, would be eligible for resentencing. 
This doesn't mean that they would all get resentenced, but at least they have a shot at getting out earlier or getting out at all. And in, in addition, nearly 500 abuse survivors who are currently in the court system would become eligible for alternative sentencing. And this past May, just before the legislature, legislative session ended, um, the act passed in the state assembly. And again, this is after years and years of organizing and advocacy by people outside, including formerly incarcerated women who survived domestic violence. You know, they shared their stories, they talked about what happened, you know, what led them to prison. And by domestic violence advocates who said, you know, we can't be punishing people twice. You know, you survived years of violence, you know, only to be punished for finally fighting back. Um, and it has yet to pass the state senate, hence the, you know, so, um, keeping this in mind. But advocates will be trying again when the legislative session starts. So for those of you who vote, who are registered to vote, who just live in New York State or New York City, you know, keep this in mind when this is election season and perhaps call your legislator that represents you and say, hey, where do you stand on this? You know, what, why do you think that domestic violence survivors should be sentenced to life in prison? Thank you. It's the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act. But if the jury decides that you're still guilty, say you have 12 people on the jury that don't understand domestic violence, and perhaps the, the defense attorney is not bringing in expert witnesses to really unpack it, they might say, well, why didn't you just leave instead of stabbing your abuser when he was trying to choke you to death? Like, why didn't you leave six months ago or six years ago? Or So she might, this person might still be convicted and then it allows the judge to say, but had you not been in an abusive situation, you would not have done what you did. 34,000 women in state prisons who are convicted of a violent offense. Yeah. So, but I don't know what the statistic is of people who are violent because yeah. also you have to think about who gets prosecuted um, and who gets imprisoned. So somebody might get, um, might get prosecuted and that person might not be imprisoned for a violent act. So she asked about de the deinstitutionalization of people with mental illnesses and how this has affected the prison population. So in the 1970s and 1980s, a lot of mental health resources, including mental health facilities, were closed down, uh, which then meant that a lot of people were kind of like left to fend for themselves. And if you are, if you have mental health issues or mental illness, you know, being able to do things like, you know, like manage your medications and manage everything else that goes along with living in society is a lot harder. Um, and as a result, we started seeing jails becoming the de facto repository for people with mental illnesses. So people who say were not taking their medications or, you know, but they would have had they had more support would end up doing things. Sometimes it were low level crimes, sometimes it were, you know, uh, more harmful acts towards people, you know, would end up in jails, you know, and some of them would be sentenced to prisons. And there are statistics, which I don't have um, with me or know off the top of my head, that, you know, of this, there's a certain percentage of people with mental illness in prisons. And these are people who are diagnosed, you know. So if you think about the fact that there might be people who are not diagnosed because, you know, like they don't exhibit extreme behaviors, but might still have, be suffering from mental illness, which if, they were given the proper support on the outside, wouldn't have ended up in jail or prison. And then you have like the revolving door of people who have mental illnesses, um, not only going to jails and prisons, but not being able to follow some of the rules of the jails and the prisons. So they tend to end up being punished more often um, because they say like, don't follow an order, or they don't go back to their housing unit when they were told to go back to their housing unit, or they talk back, or they act bizarre. You know, like, and people are just like, wait, what are you doing? You know, like, you can't stand on that table or, you know, you can't do something else. Um, so they tend to be punished more and they tend to end up in some form of solitary confinement, which, again, imagine being locked in your tiny little New York City bathroom as a person without mental health issues. Now, imagine if you have mental health issues being locked in that tiny little room um, for days, if not weeks or months on end. Um, so, so there's like a whole you know, cascade of consequences as a result of the deinstitutionalization of people with mental illness. There is a case in Pennsylvania right now working its way through the court in which a man has spent the past 36 years, 
in solitary confinement. Three, six years. Like not three to six, 36 years. So think about being locked away from people for 36 years and think about the fact that this might not ever, you know, like think about the fact that, at, that like how this would affect anyone's well-being if you were locked in there. In Chicago's Cook County Jail, um, the sheriff there has talked about having a mental health jail. But if you think about this, why do people with mental illnesses need to be placed in jail? In where you are locked in, where you are subjected to being escorted all the time, being shackled. Like remember what I described earlier about you know pregnant women being shackled. That is everybody. Anytime you are taken out to court or to the hospital or you know like out in or out of prison, like why would you subject somebody with mental illness to these kinds of conditions? And why is that the de facto place to put people? Solitary confinement is if you are a guard, and I'm not advocating for this, but. From the guard's point of view, it is a fantastic management tool because you lock somebody in their cell and you don't have to be worried that they are going and doing anything else. So the more people you have locked away, sort of the less worries you have about control. Is this person over here doing something that they shouldn't? Is this person over here fighting with this person? Again, I'm not advocating for this, but from the guard's point of view, this is a fantastic stick to hold over people. If you don't do this, you go to solitary confinement. And when you place people in solitary confinement, really all you have to do is go around and like shove, your, shove meals at them. You don't have to escort them places. You don't have to worry that they're doing anything. They're not arguing with you. you know, so it is from you know, the staff standpoint, a really useful management tool. Um, and also people who've been placed in solitary confinement have also been branded oftentimes as quote unquote, the worst of the worst which then justifies placing them in there. You know, so people who are worried about violence think that, they, that this is only people who have committed egregious harm to other people and not necessarily people who might have pissed off you know, a guard or have filed too many lawsuits. Or you know, like in women's prisons, women who report sexual abuse by guards, going back to your question about sexual abuse, are often placed in solitary confinement, quote unquote, for their own protection, quote unquote, pending investigation. Which then means that if you weren't going to report that abuse before, and then maybe you thought you should, then you realize you're going to be placed in solitary confinement for your own protection. Mm -hmm. Nah, maybe you'll be quiet about this. If you think about, and I hate to use the economic rationale because then I feel like then like once you you know like once the economy is booming again, nobody cares. But if you think about the fact that you have people who are mentally ill in jails, right? So you're paying for the guards to house them, you're paying for all the like, you know, like lock up bells and whistles, you know, like the shackles and everything else. And you have to pay for mental health staff, unless you lock them away in solitary confinement. Um, but really it doesn't address mental health issues. It doesn't address the fact that like maybe if they were just on medications or if they were like adhering to a program, maybe they would be able to somewhat function and they don't need to be locked away. Um, so I think, yes, it should be that more mental health resources should be devoted to people with mental illnesses and not the de facto throw them, you know, throw them in jail and let the jail staff deal with them. Supposedly, it's for their own protection. And supposedly, it is pending investigation. You know, this would, these would be the official lines. If you were to call up a prison and say, why did you lock up so-and-so, you know, be, after reporting sexual abuse? Um, but, you know, informally or unofficially, it is a really good deterrent because nobody wants to be locked away in solitary confinement. And keep in mind that when you are locked away in this tiny little room, the size of a New York City bathroom, you don't have access to other people, you know? So which means that if you are in your housing unit, you may not like everybody in your housing unit, you may not get along with everybody in your housing unit, but you're around other people and somebody there, hopefully, you can cry to them, they can like talk to you, they can be like, hey, you know, there's this resource over here. When you are locked away in solitary confinement, the only people you have access to are the guards who can choose whether your food comes to you hot when it's supposed to be hot, or if your food is supposed to be cold, it comes to you cold, or if you get like, you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, warm milk and cold, you know, cold chicken type of thing, you know, like, so these are really good 
disincentives. I believe that the rate of incarceration for women has, like, you know, like if you're looking at rates, has dropped. So in 1996, when welfare reform was just was first introduced and pushed over 100,000 women off welfare rolls, that was when there was this dramatic, dramatic increase, you know, where it was twice that of men. And I don't know what the rates are now, but I think that the overall prison population has dropped, but the rate of, or the number of women in prisons you know, continues to increase. I think media plays a huge role, you know, so, so, you know, like on the like news media side, oftentimes we don't see women in prison. So then we, people rely on things like Orange is the New Black, you know, or if they're talking about prison issues, they're talking about them as if women don't exist or as if trans people don't exist. So when we talk about, when you read things about solitary confinement, you read about men. And then you take, like that leaves out the nuances, like, women being sent to solitary confinement for reporting <laughs> sexual abuse. You know, like, like it leaves out some of these issues that are really, really important. Like if you report assault, you should be allowed to report assault. You shouldn't be facing more punishment for reporting assault. So a lot of times you don't see women included in these, you know, like grand news articles about prison issues. And then on the media, um, on the like sort of pop culture media side, depicting people in prison or depicting men in prison as violent and aggressive and scary fuels this hype that people need to be locked up. You know, like, and it, it justifies spending, you know, millions of dollars. I mean, here in New York City, um, at Rikers Island, so we have this whole island devoted to pretrial detention. 85% of people are there because they can't afford bail and they're awaiting their trial. The de Blasio administration just announced that they're going to be building another building on the jet, you know, in the island. So if you think about what would you be able to do with the one billion dollars that they've earmarked to build this building? Like what could New York City do for people with one billion dollars? What kinds of services could you provide? What kind of housing, supportive housing, you know, mental health treatment, you know, like employment, childcare, you know, you name it. Like what could we do with one billion dollars that's gonna go instead to building yet another jail for mostly people awaiting trial because they can't afford bail. But even if he were, say, to have, you know, like killed somebody, that's not justification for keeping him in there for 36 years without any recourse, without any ability to go before a committee to be like, you know, I've changed, I've, you know, like something, something. And it doesn't address whatever it was that he did, you know, 36 years ago, which, I think in the span of a lot of jail and prison staff, that's like two generations of prison staff ago because a lot of people like, you know, like end up retiring and, you know, like moving on. So it's like, does anybody in that prison remember why this guy is locked in for 36 years? That's always a tricky question because there's some places that, like I, like I was telling, I was saying earlier, like every prison and jail is kind of like its own little fiefdom. And then it also depends on who's in charge. So there are some prisons, like, so there's the women's prison, Bedford Hills, which is the maximum security prison for women in New York State. And in the 1980s, there was a superintendent, Elaine Lord, who really believed in rehabilitation and put in programs, you know? So she, like, you know, like, so she put in a family violence program. It was, like, the first, you know, in the, in the state, if not the nation, to address domestic violence in the 1980s. You know, she put in also, she allowed the women who are incarcerated inside to run all sorts of programs and supports and resources. She is now retired and the women who are there now say, you know, the next wardens did not care so much about rehabilitation. They weren't willing to open up the prison and kind of put their resources, you know, both money and guard power into allowing these programs to continue to flourish. So it's kind of a tricky question because what might be something that you could point to might go away when somebody else comes into so, power. Creating mental health services also brings more jobs and, you know, more resources. And also there's not, you know, so, so there's building the facility, which is $1 billion, but then you have to spend the money to staff it, which is, you know, so, so $1 billion gives you the brick and mortar building. It doesn't, you know, provide the like, you know, like staffing or the training or, you know, anything else. It's like, here is your building. Now spend more money to like, actually make it work. I think they said it was intake, but they were not entirely positive. Um, they have not broken ground on it. They just earmarked the money for it and they like cleared off whatever, you know, whatever was there earlier, they cleared off.
but no actual like you know like digging or excavating or anything has happened yet. But um, if you look at the village voice from this weekend, there's a whole sort of like back and forth um, between what was announced and then what de Blasio quickly then said, like, oh, maybe we won't build this. We're still kind of in, you know, we're, we're still kind of deciding this. So also for people who vote, this might also be a good time to weigh in and be like, you know, we don't really want $1 billion of our money going to a new facility, a new building at Rikers. You know, perhaps this would be better off you know, with supportive housing for people who need it, or reentry services, or uh, pre-trial bail diversion, so that that way people, I'm sure most people here have heard of the tragic story of Khalif Browder, who spent three years at Rikers, pending trial for allegedly stealing a backpack, charges which were finally dismissed um, or dropped against him. So, you know, maybe fixing the bail system so that people aren't left to be incarcerated at Rikers for three years pending trial. And Khalif Browder is just the well, most well-known, but he is not an anomaly. There are other people at Rikers who have spent years awaiting trial as well. Well, if you think about, like, so, so there's a couple of different things that I'm gonna try to like tease out. So, so there's the idea of harm reduction. So if you're gonna do heroin or drug, you know, any drug, and you're just gonna continue to do this, right? And like, there's just, you're just not interested in not doing this. You know, there's harm reduction, which means that there's like ways in which um, other, some other countries do this, like Portugal does this, where, you know, like they're like, okay, here's a way to get, you know, clean needles so that you're not sharing needles and like spreading, you know, um, diseases amongst each other. And then there's like safe places to go and shoot up so that that way you don't overdose and die on the street or overdose and like have paramedics come. But then there's also criminalization, you know, where basically if you're caught with heroin, you go to jail, you know, and then you, you detox in jail or you're placed on methadone, um, which is what happens in New York City is that um, you go to methadone every day. But again, this means that you are in jail, you are confined, you have lost your liberty, you're not addressing any of the issues that under, underlie why you continue to do heroin. And the city is paying a lot of money for the guards that escort you to the hospital every day for methadone maintenance treatment, your bed, your food, you know, like everything that comes with being incarcerated, which is so much more money than if you were to have a harm reduction strategy in which, you know, it's like you come here and you get clean needles. You know, you come here and you shoot up and there's a medical professional that makes sure that you don't die, you know, on their watch. Um, I don't know a lot about drug policy in other places, so I'm not like an expert expert on this, but I know that in Portugal and in Switzerland, they've decriminalized drugs. And in Portugal, if the police arrive and they see you shooting up on the street, they hand you a card and they're like, this is where you get clean needles and this is a safe, safe, you know, safe injection facility so that that way you don't end up using the same needle as your friend over here who got it from their friend over there, who, you know, who got it from their friend over there, which reduces the amount of diseases from shooting up and also ends up, you know, like making sure that people aren't overdosing on the street. So, so there's like two different things here where it's like there's harm reduction and then there's criminalization, you know, and um, the approach that New York City is often has taken what is um, criminalization where it's like, you know, like you get caught with drugs, you end up going to Rikers Island, which then ends up being a huge expense, you know, on all of us because it's like, well, all right, if you were shooting up, which I'm not advocating that anybody like go and shoot up if this is, you know, um, but if you're doing this, you end up going to jail and there is no, again, no addressing why are you doing this? You know, like, are you hurting your friends or family? Like, do you have like, you know, like family members that are really worried about you or, you know, children that you're not taking care of or elderly people in your families that you're not taking care of? It's just like punishment, that's it. Um, versus a harm reduction strategy where it's like, if you're going to do it, and then there's also drug treatment, you know, where it's like, okay, somebody's like, either somebody realizes they have a problem or somebody's family is like, you need to go there because you are ripping our family apart. You know, so, so there's these three different things, but I don't know if that's quite answering your question, but there are these three different approaches that you could take towards heroin addiction. So there's actually statistics that show that the people who are least likely to reoffend are people convicted of murder. Because basically, unless you are Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, you, you, you like, you know, kill once, you go to prison, you get out probably many, many years later, you know, 
and you try to rebuild your life. You don't go out and like, you know, like pick a fight and murder somebody again. Um, the people who are most likely to reoffend are people with drug addictions. So actually, it's actually a little, maybe it's not funny, but it's a little ironic that the people who are convicted of nonviolent drug offenses that are the most sympathetic, you know, in popular opinion and public, you know, public discourse are the people who are most likely, because we don't have the kinds of support set up for being like, hey, you have a problem. Let's figure out how to manage this problem. Either we solve this problem, you go to drug treatment, you get rid of your addiction, or let's figure out how to manage this so you don't continually break the law and end up back in jail or prison, you know, and or hurt people while you're doing this. Orange is the New Black is entertainment. You know, it's like meant for entertainment. So I appreciate the fact that it opens up conversations for, you know, speaking about women in prison that weren't there earlier, like in pop culture, or like if you go to something where you know, you're talking to a bunch of people and you say, you know, I write about women in prison. They're like, yeah, that's nice. Whereas now, if you say, I write about women in prison, they say, oh, like orange is the new black. And it opens up that door, but it is a really exaggerated portrayal of like what a women's prison is. Like, it's kind of like, you know, if you throw a bunch of people on an island, you know, like that show, and then like, you know, like you see how they all react to each other. It's kind of like that, you know? So there's a lot of dramatization. There's a lot of things that they think make it interesting for a TV viewing audience, but don't necessarily portray the realities of a women's prison. At the same time, like the, the way that the TV dramatization, so if, you've, if you read Orange is the New Black, the actual memoir, you know, it, it is definitely not a comedy. You know, like it is not, you know, like the sort of like everybody like is there and it's kind of like being in high school and there's drama and there's tension and people are fighting and then there's a lot of sex in the showers. You know, like it, it, it's very like, you know, like it's much more of a like this is what prison is. It sucks. There's, you know, like there's all the, you know, like inhuman indignities that you have to go through on a day to day basis, you know, like, you know, like pat searches, you know, strip searches, being separated from your family, seeing that, like, you know, like, seeing a woman, you know, like, call home and find out that something awful happened in her family and not being able to do anything about it. Two things like sexual abuse by guards, whereas the TV show, it being a TV show, kind of, like, makes it so that it's fun to watch and nobody ever wants to watch something that's, like, depressing news, depressing news, sad, sad, depressing news, you know, injustices, outrage, sad, sad. So, so if you look at it that way, like that's not something that most people will tune into, you know, for more than 10 minutes.